The CW Chronicles Sinners Written by Silvano Williams All content copyright 2013-2023 All rights reserved Chapter 8 The Rescue Effort I flew through a space armada squadron, effortlessly avoiding their attacks while my fellow Dimension police pilots disposed of them. Seeing the simplicity of their attack patterns, I devised a plan to draw their attention to me, by flying directly at their groups, guns blazing, while the other DP officers came up from the flanks and took the rest of them out. I was willing to be more reckless than most. After the Space Armada's surprise attack, we regrouped and were slowly on our road to recovery. And by road to recovery, I mean I led the effort to obliterate the Space Armada from existence. As heartbreaking as it was at first, the plan had proven effective, and we had slowly gained the upper hand. The only thing we had not been able to do was fly closer to the burning moon and attack Villain directly. The Space Armada would coordinate and concentrate their numbers, forcing us to retreat when we tried. It was a weird tactic since they would then scatter right after, instead of maintaining the focused effort against us, which undoubtedly would have totally ruined our day. Flying my ship and shooting down the mindless Space Armada drones was not difficult. I switched my attention between the Space Armada, CW, and Ilona's monitors without a problem. Ilona and the commander continued to analyze the data our scanners had provided. The commander watched his monitors, staying mostly silent after speaking to CW. Ilona suddenly looked concerned. Commander, we have been unable to find how Villain animated those corpses. However, she lowered her voice. I have studied their flight patterns, sir, and they do show signs of intelligence. The commander did not react. He stared at his monitors, unmoved. Perhaps, she continued, we should reconsider the order to destroy those bodies until we have a chance to study them further. Your observation has been noted, Medical Officer Ilona. The commander answered stiffly. However, my order stands. Going back on it now will jeopardize our officers. The commander pointed at the many monitors, floating in front of their faces. Look, war all around us. This has gone beyond our own code or laws. This is a fight for survival, not only for the remaining life on that planet, but for our own. I wanted to argue, although I didn't disagree with him. Then I noticed something peculiar. Ilona had set their transmission to private, and I was the only recipient. Ilona replied to the commander persuasively. I understand that, sir. However, I am forced to echo Vlad's concerns. The captain will not approve of this once he hears about it. She did not change the commander's mind. This is my burden. He said and paused as if searching for words. If I am wrong, a great mistake I will answer to. He took in a deep, ragged breath to regain his composure. We must minimize our casualties and secure the life on this planet. He said. He then looked up sharply at me. Vladimir. He said gravely. The life force on this planet must not be allowed to be extinguished. An officer came up behind the commander and Ilona. Sir. He blurted without waiting for permission to speak. The rescue transports are ready. Good. The commander answered him, forcing himself to sound more positive. Deploy at once. Extraction is at the location Captain Weenie has provided. On the commander's approval, four cargo transports detached from the sides of the giant command center. They were as large as two stacked freight train cars. They flew away from us toward the opposite side of the planet. Their slow flight worried me, so I changed my course and began to fly to them to provide an escort. Lieutenant, the commander ordered, Remain in the fight. We do not want to call attention to the transports. They will fly to the other side of the planet and approach from there. Just make sure no space armada ships pursue. It made sense, so I turned around. The cargo transports disappeared from our view unnoticed. CW landed back on the mainland after playing hopscotch from island to island. The wind was much stronger. He was barely able to see beyond a few feet away, even with his perfect eyesight. 
The rain was heavy, the air saturated with dirt, the raindrops turning to mud in midair. Lightning struck the ground from the low clouds above. Yellow and violet hues of light, followed by thunder, illuminated the orange land around him. He focused his eyesight on the chaos and locating more froggies. Hundreds of froggies had convened where the reversed magnetic pulse had struck. Many more fought against the rumbling land and the inclement weather to join them. C.W. walked to the gathered froggies, his steps grounded him firmly against the winds. Much like Villain he was powerful, but unlike Villain he did not feel he had to use his power to achieve his goals. His sense of hope made him feel assured that he could find success without having to abuse his abilities. He felt having this much power was a test, and he was not worthy of it. Deep in his heart, he knew the Dimension Police and I would show up at any minute and help him save these beings. The Froggies, focused and enthralled by both the glow and light show of the approaching reversed magnetic pulse bubble in the sky above them, hadn't noticed C.W. approaching until he walked among them. They chanted in unison, their arms extended into the air as if trying to grab it. C.W. looked up at the sky and back down at the Froggies, attempting to empathize with them, trying to feel their fear and confusion. I will save you, he whispered kindly to the froggies around him. His voice was comforting and carried clearly even through the roaring winds. The froggies became hysterical. Their little throats inflated with anger as they croaked offensively at him and pushed him away. C.W. understood they were afraid of him, but his determination to save them was firm. He grabbed several of them in his arms and jumped high into the air away from the large group. The weather became progressively worse, and the winds had reached hurricane speeds. All over the ocean, tornadic waterspouts formed from the storm clouds above. C.W. splashed through one that appeared right in front of him as he was still in mid-jump. The force of the winds was so strong it pushed C.W. slightly off course, almost making him miss his landing on the small island ahead. When he landed, he decided to take smaller jumps, although this would take more time. He realized that if he took smaller yet more powerful jumps, the winds would not affect his trajectory. Just as he prepared for the next jump, the ground rumbled and volcanic eruptions lit up the horizon. After several hops, he eventually landed next to his makeshift enclosure and deposited the new batch of froggies inside it. They croaked disapprovingly at him. As C.W. was getting ready to jump back to the mainland for another group of froggies, the commander stopped him with an announcement. Captain, the commander said, the rescue transports have been deployed and should arrive at your location in a minute. C.W. smiled and replied, Thank you, commander. Things are getting worse. The weather in the mainland has deteriorated, and there are now tornadoes and volcanic activity. Something out in the distance caught C.W.'s attention. It was the four cargo transports skimming the ocean surface, flying at full speed toward him. They are almost here. C.W. exclaimed, happy to see the approaching rescue ships. They were close enough now that he waved to show them his proposed landing spot. The skies above the transports cracked open with lightning bolts and flashing aurora borealis, followed by ground-trembling thunder. But the thunderous sounds did not fade away. The echoing thunder continued and grew louder. C.W. looked past the transports and followed the lightning trails back toward the mainland. In the background, he could see when the reversed magnetic pulse reached the lowest layer of the atmosphere. It was now fully visible from the ground. However, that was not the cause of the growing roaring noise. Space Armada ships zoomed past the approaching rescue transports and shot a torrent of plasma bolts at CW. Commander, the Space Armada is here. CW managed to say just before stretching out his arms to grab the enclosure's metal walls and placing himself over them to tent in the froggies. CW desperately tried to save as many of the froggies as he could from the hellfire, by shielding them with his own body, but many of them were not within the protective cocoon he had created. The blasts lit the wet sand on fire all around him, instantly obliterating all the vegetation and the unshielded froggies. Even after being hit with hundreds of plasma cannon shots, C.W. stood firm, which saved the froggies underneath him. To his dismay, he looked up just in time to see another Space Armada group destroy three of the four transports that attempted to land next to him. 
The fires from the rescue ship's explosions consumed everything around him. The shockwave and shrapnel from the transports swept the ground from underneath him, forcing the metal enclosure apart and out of his protection. Commander. He heaved in horror. Commander. But it was in vain. The commander could not answer, because the communicator had melted to slag inside CW's ear.